Thank you, Minister, for joining us. Um, I mean, as Anya previewed, I'm sure the audience and me as well, were very keen to hear your views on US-Chinese relations and Singapore's role in that. But I thought I'd start with, with COVID-19, which is after all the reason we're all meeting virtually rather than in person. Um, my impression is that Singapore has done pretty well, uh, but that you've also had uh, crises, particularly around migrant workers. What's the current situation in Singapore? Well, we have had a serious problem with the migrant workers living in the dormitories. We have about 300,000 of them living in dormitories. And as you know, with the benefit of six months of data, if you live in a dormitory and on an aircraft carrier, on a luxury cruise liner, regardless of the class of, of accommodation, if you are eating together, interacting intensively together, you're meeting, you're socializing, you're at high risk. So that's where the center of gravity of our infection has been. Fortunately, however, in the local community, as far as local citizens and permanent residents are concerned, we're down to just a handful of cases a day. So we've done well at the community level. We are sweeping up the problems in the dormitories. I, we, are, we would have completed testing all two to 300,000 of them by the end of this week. And that's why the numbers still look high, because in fact, the cases that we're detecting now are asymptomatic. These are cases that would not otherwise have been diagnosed. But we are testing because we want them to be able to get back to work and to get back to work safely. So you that's where we're at. Back, back to work. I, I wondered then about this, the impact on the economy, because Singapore is one of the great cities of globalization, transport hub, finance hub, you name it. Everything's frozen. How are you coping economically? Well, first, not everything is frozen. As I said earlier, I think tourism, aviation, certainly that's deeply affected. But transshipment, uh, transit passengers, logistics, all those are still flowing. And indeed, it has been critically important for us to maintain our status as a hub at this point in time, to keep it open and to let everyone know that even in the depths of a crisis, we're not going to panic. We will remain open. We will not impound supplies, whether it's masks or essential uh, drugs or medical supplies. And all these things have continued to flow. So that, that part has been important. Nevertheless, the fact that we needed to have a circuit breaker of about eight weeks has had a major impact on our economy. So in the second quarter, I mean, there's a significant dip and we expect that we will end this year somewhere between minus five to minus seven percent. So that for a place like Singapore, 55 years of almost uninterrupted growth, that's a big deal. So it has had an impact. And as, and as if COVID-19 wasn't enough, you also now in this downward spiral of relations between China and the United States. And again, you're a sort of both economic and a political hub between those two countries. And I would say probably the only country I can think of that could really claim to have a special relationship both with the People's Republic of China and with the United States. So you must be in a slightly uncomfortable position. But before I ask you specifically about how Singapore is handling it as a nation state, can I ask you, just as an analyst, how worried are you by this change in the environment and the rapid down shift in the relationship? We're deeply worried. Let, let me take a step back and share with you. For those of you who haven't been to Singapore, we're... The way to think about Singapore is imagine downtown Manhattan having been ejected by upstate New York and having to be an independent city state. And in the case of Singapore, trade is three times our GDP. So I say this so that you understand that when I talk about free trade, it's not just a debating point, but it's absolutely essential for our survival and indeed our economic existence. That's the first factoid. Second factoid, if I was to ask you, who is the biggest investor in Singapore? And the answer is United States of America. In fact, the United States of America has more invested in Singapore and Southeast Asia than it has in India, China, Korea, and Japan combined. Every time I meet President Trump, I remind him of that. I remind him that America has significant equities in our part of the world. Third factoid, 
the largest trading partner for Singapore is China. And you want to add another fourth factoid is that in fact, one of the largest foreign investors in China is Singapore. So Gideon, when you say we are in between and we have a special relationship with both the United States and China, that is not an assumption, that is a fact and it's based on real data. So clearly we watch these, this unfolding dynamic relation with great concern. And from my trips to, my repeated trips to Washington, what I have felt is that there is increasingly a bipartisan consensus within America, certainly within the political class of America, that China is a competitor, a rival, and I would say a strategic rival. And they are worried about China and both parties are trying to look at the entire repertoire of levers which they will use or may use against China. And when you hear so your concern. interlocutors, when your interlocutors in Washington say that to you, that we regard China increasingly as a strategic rival, what do you say? Do you say you're wrong, you shouldn't be thinking of it that way, or do you see their point? Well, it depends on how much time they have. And I would, my starting point would be that if you look at the end of the Second World War, the United States constituted 40% of global GDP. At that level, it made sense for the United States to underwrite the liberal world order as we know it, which has been a formula for peace and prosperity, especially for democratic Southeast Asia, of which Singapore has been one. Now, the problem now is that after 1978, China opened up. In 1991, India opened up. And with the fall of the Soviet Union, even the, the Russia and the rest of Eastern Europe came online. Now, all these actually are positive developments. But what it does mean is that the United States today constitutes maybe about 25% of global GDP, which means it is an entirely legitimate question for the American voters to say, wait a minute, why does the United States have to pay in blood and treasure to underwrite this world order when they're down to 24% and probably shrinking. The key point here is that we are moving from a unipolar world into a multipolar world. And it's very important for everyone to understand the implications of that because if you wistfully think about the so-called good old days and hope that America somehow will go back into the good old days where it will single-handedly carry this world. That's not realistic. It's not realistic economically, militarily, and it's certainly not realistic politically. So the current administration's focus, in a sense, on putting America first, is actually a rational political development to a change in the world internally within America and at a global level. So I do not start by saying that America is wrong. I make the observation that it is a perfectly legitimate question. The next question then that arises is what of the future? What does a multipolar world look like? What will American leadership in a multipolar world look like? What should America focus on? And here, let me give you some personal insights. When I was Minister for Environment, I spent many years as a ministerial facilitator that ultimate, in the negotiations that ultimately led to the Paris Agreement. And I can tell you as someone who was on the inside, in the green room, so to speak, the only reason we could get a successful Paris Agreement is because America and China were on a congruent course and made it happen. And here's the rub of it. All our future strategic challenges are going to be transnational. Climate change, pandemics, which we can discuss more of, cyberspace, outer space. All these big challenges will require cooperation, will require multipolar leadership, will require multilateral institutions and processes. 
So I just had a dis chat with uh, Mike Pompeo yesterday, and I said, well, we in fact need America back in the saddle, but there will be multiple horses. It won't be one horse and one man in a horse. And what do you say to that? Because in fact, I mean, you had the privilege of talking to him directly. I've been reading his speeches, but he's very much on the line now that American policy towards China was a mistake, uh, a misperception of how China was going to develop, that they are ideological rivals, strategic rivals. Um, and I would imagine that he would be sort of putting you on the spot and saying, Mr. Minister, whose side are you on? So what do you say when you're asked that? We, we have a great relationship, so I have the luxury of being completely frank and open with him. And I, and I explained to him that, in fact, there is a kind of a Goldilocks syndrome going on here. You know, you know the story of Goldilocks and you want the porridge to be neither too hot or too cold. And I told him, in Asia, there are two opposite polarities that we worry about. Number one is a collision with a hot war with China. But on the other hand, we're also worried that America may pick up its, its marbles and decide, well, I don't want to play this game in Asia anymore. In fact, what all of us in Asia want is for America and China to sort out their strategic differences, find a modest vivendi to resolve these differences, and also to be able to collaborate on the multilateral global challenges that we face, and on that basis to continue to engage Asia. Because both America and China have got huge equities in Asia. For China, just this year, its largest trading partner is now Southeast Asia. It's not even the US or the EU. And for the US, you know, the largest so chunk of investments is in Southeast Asia. Half a million US jobs depend on trade with Southeast Asia. So my point is not to look at things in binary terms and you know, enemies and friends, true sides, but to actually recognize that we are transiting to a multipolar world, that you must not look at things in purely binary terms. By all means, recognize the differences, resolve the differences, but do not lose sight of the larger equities at stake. And to be fair to the current administration, they listen, they may not agree with me, but they listen politely and we have perfectly civil and constructive discussions on that basis. That's, that's nice to hear, but I mean, I've talked a lot about how America's at, or asked you about how America's attitude is changing. But as I said at the beginning, you, you know China very well as well. So I think people will be interested to have a sense of your view. Are the Americans and others right to think that something has changed under Xi Jinping, that China has become more assertive? People often say the old days, the hide and bide are over, that China is, is, is clearly intent now on being the dominant power, at least in its region. Well, a couple of points I would make to that. First is that the change, the transformation in China since 1978 and the way they have uplifted hundreds of millions of people from abject poverty. Through this system, a hybrid system of capitalism, party dominance uh, and integration into the world economy. This has been a historically unprecedented achievement. And quite frankly, an achievement worth celebrating, both within China and outside China. We've all benefited from that development because in fact, if China had not opened up, had not reformed, had not transformed 40 years ago, I think the world would have been in a much more perilous state than it is now. That's the first point. The second point, is that you need to understand that China is a civilizational state. It's not really even a nation state. And it's a civilizational state with a very long view of history. And when they look back in history, 10,000 years, a thousand years ago, who invented gunpowder, the sextant, the paper, printing? Who had ocean going fleets, perhaps even getting to America before Columbus? was China. Did they make a strategic mistake after that? They did by turning inwards. And for China, the last century or two, because they missed 
the Industrial Revolution. There have been centuries of humiliation. Now they feel, quite rightly, they are on the verge of re-establishing their position in the world order. And that, to me, is an entirely legitimate ambition. Another point worth emphasizing about China, because it is a civilizational state, they don't have the same missionary approach that the Europeans and to a, to a significant extent even America has had. They have no intention of creating or make or molding us in their image. Correspondingly, they also have no intention of being changed into American image. And that's why if America set out 40 years ago, hoping that China would be transformed and changed into its likeness, by his engagement, then that was always wishful and misguided thinking. So we need a combination of realism and appreciation of history and culture on both sides. But you see, the point I'm trying to make is that even this rise of China is really part of this transformation into a multipolar world. And into that multipolar world, I will include Europe. And if you, for, if you look forward over the next two, three decades, do not forget that there are significant young, hungry populations, ambitious populations in India, in the Middle East, in Africa, and in South America. And we need to come to terms with this, with this world. You see? So it's important not to hearken back to a past, a misremembered past, but it is important to focus on the future and how a multipolar world is both essential for peace and prosperity, and also for change, transforming the way we look at diplomacy. And this old point, you know, this old canard about you either with us or against us does not work in a multipolar world. Fortunately, in the case of Singapore, we have had long strategic relations with both superpowers based on trust and openness, and we've been able to speak truth to power. Courteously, obviously, but nevertheless, we've been able to say that and not to be offensive. Well, best of luck. I sort of feel that we're all going to be put on the spot increasingly. That's certainly the case the UK found, even with Huawei. I'll ask you one more question, but before I do that, I just want to alert the audience uh, uh, that we're taking questions, and the way to do it is to use the hands up facility, and I will then call upon people in about five minutes' time. But um, if I can ask you a, a couple more specific controversies, though, at the moment, I, I alluded to this sense that, you know, China's getting tougher, harder to deal with. Hong Kong is uh, something that people are looking at, and indeed the Uyghur issue. Um, when, say, Mr. Pompeo says to you, look, there are terrible human rights abuses taking place in Xinjiang, we can't ignore that. I'd, I'd be interested in your response to that. And also specifically, as the other great hub city to, to Hong Kong, how do you view what's happening there? Do you think that Hong Kong's role as a, as a hub is in some sense in question now? Let's, let's deal with Hong Kong first, because rightly or wrongly, many people often like to compare and contrast Hong Kong and, and Singapore. After all, we're both entrepreneurs, we're both, uh, you know, paragons of the modern economy. The first thing I would say as someone with an appreciation for Chinese history is that in fact, Hong Kong was an icon of Chinese humiliation. It got handed over to the Brits because of the Opium Wars. So the return of Hong Kong to China was both inevitable and essential. That's the first point. The second point is that if you look at what has happened in Hong Kong since the handover, and in particular over the last few years, you witness a deeply divided, fractured society. The riots are symptoms of this underlying fracture and even the violence that sometimes spills over. And Hong Kong was also 
always supposed to have been able to pass a national security law. And this was provided for in the basic law. But for a variety of political and social reasons, it couldn't get to this stage. And if you put yourself now in, and I'm not trying to you know, be an apologist for Beijing, but if you put yourself in their position and you ask yourself, what's going to happen over the remaining 27 years? Is the current trend sustainable? Is it good for stability, for progress, for economic development in Hong Kong? And I think the answer, certainly in a significant portion of Hong Kong populations that the current trends are unhealthy and not sustainable. So China decided they needed to be more interventionist, which I think we are witnessing right now. And the passage of the national security law from Beijing is an example of that. Now, they have asserted that this is entirely consistent with their sovereign rights, entirely consistent with the basic law. They have also asserted that it will not affect the majority of Hong Kongers and their businesses. And I think we'll have to see how things pan out in, on the ground in reality. But unfortunately, this has also now become part of the hurly-burly and the push and shove between China and the United States and to some extent the United Kingdom as well. But let me just say as an Asian or from, from a fellow city in Asia, that actually all that Singapore hopes for is a stable, calm, peaceful, and prosperous Hong Kong. If they do well, it's good for Northeast Asia, it's good for Asia, and it's good for Singapore. So that's how we, we look at it. I mean, I can honestly tell you, we wish them the very best in solving what is essentially a political problem, first within Hong Kong society, and also hoping that this does not blow up into a yet another international incident that will destabilize Asia. I, I did mention the Uyghurs as well. Do you want to say something about that? Well, we don't, to be f honest with you, we didn't discuss the, the Uyghurs when I spoke to Mike yesterday, so I don't want to make comments. Okay, on... fair enough. Uh, now, let me go to the, uh, the, the questions from uh, the floor. Um, if I'm seeing correctly, I've got uh, two, two possible questioners. Um, could I call upon Rich Berry? I'm apparently that takes about five seconds or so till he comes up. Good morning, Minister. Hi, Rich. Good morning, sir. Um, calling from Hawaii this morning, and uh, thank you for joining us. Really enjoyed your comments and getting in your interview. A couple of quick questions. Um, specifically on Hong Kong, uh, how do you, um, when you take a look at the agreements, though, that the PRC made uh, in Hong Kong when the British handed it over uh, and the erosion of, of rights there, because uh, I understand perfectly your point about the history there and how they feel about it. But I think maybe the bigger concern in the U.S. government has been the international agreements that they feel like have been broken based on the, on the handover. And then the second question I want to ask you about, or how do you see the, uh, the, the issues with the intellectual property uh, that we tend to have with the Chinese um, and how that might get in the way of uh, international trade and finance from your perspective there in Singapore? Thank you again for your comments. Thank you. Well, two, two excellent uh, questions. I'm not in a position to judge compliance or otherwise with international agreements. But what I would say is that as far as the Chinese are concerned, Hong Kong is an inalienable part of China, and therefore they remind us frequently that this is a domestic matter. And we have to respect this issue of sovereignty. But having said that, as I said in my earlier comments, there is clearly a political problem within Hong Kong society, and this is something that Hong Kongers themselves will have to resolve and have to resolve with their capital as well. And time will tell 
how this will unfold. I really do not believe that uh, our commentary from outside would necessarily be helpful for this process, this essential process of reconciliation and focusing on the challenges of the future for Hong Kong society. It's a complicated uh, situation. And, you know, I, I really don't think it is helpful for us to simply cast judgment from overseas. So that's how we see it. And as I said, the key thing is, will Hong Kong society become more united, more cohesive, more capable of settling their social political challenges? For instance, housing for young families, jobs, the economic restructuring which they need, Hong Kong's role in the Pearl River Delta, and indeed as a portal into the larger Chinese economy. Actually, for most people on the ground, and certainly for my Hong Kong friends, those are the key concerns. Jobs, security, homes, prospects for the future, peace and stability. But these are things which, in our conception of a nation state, are sovereign matters which are best handled by the political leaders and the people within the country itself. So that's how I, I would view it. Your second question was on um, intellectual property. Well, on this point, I want to say that as far as Singapore is concerned, you know, we, we have a free trade agreement with the United States. There's a whole chapter there on intellectual property. In fact, I believe that as China's economy becomes more sophisticated, and in fact, they are now one of the, I think they are the largest uh, registrants of patents in the world now. China has an equally, if not more important stake in intellectual property protection. And certainly in Singapore's experience in our free trade agreement with the United States, and indeed in the TPP, which the United States unfortunately did not become a part of. But the intellectual property protections enshrined in the free trade agreements, including the TPP, are an important step forward in raising standards of intellectual property protection. So I make no, no apologies for taking every opportunity to remind America that we've left the door open for the TPP and the ambitious standards for intellectual property protection, for environmental protection, for labor protection, all those are worth subscri subscribing to. Even China is now looking, a bit quizzically perhaps, but looking seriously at joining the TPP. So the point here is to look at things in a dynamic and in a forward perspective. And I, I am very sure that China will have to be far more protective of intellectual property as it goes forward. And this, this is just the natural evolution of things. If you go back in economic history, I think even the UK and US had disputes with intellectual property a century or two centuries ago. That, that's, you know, that's a fact. And these things happen. So let's not be bogged down by it, but let's look at how we can move forward. And I'm, I'm optimistic that intellectual property, especially in this knowledge-based economy, it's, you know, it's the new oil. And the difference between oil and intellectual property is that the value is enhanced by sharing and openness, and it's not a question of scarcity. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, the next question that I'd like to call upon is Evan Marks. who will be appearing shortly, I think. Yeah, I think it takes about five seconds. Yeah. Gentlemen, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Good morning from Aspen, Colorado. Uh, the Washington Post made an interesting list of flashpoints between the United States and China. They range from TikTok, Hong Kong spying, Huawei, uh, media tariffs and trades, Xinjiang, um, travel, research, South China Seas, uh, Taiwan, delisting of Chinese companies, Tibet. However, um, none of these have had the impact of actually killing as many Americans as the Hiroshima bomb killed Japanese. 
i.e. the coronavirus. Do you believe from your perspective that China owes a debt to the rest of the world for um, not containing through international travel of CV-19 when they clearly uh, restricted and locked down Wuhan to domestic travel? Well, let me give you a perspective from Asia. You know, in fact, um, I think China is the, has, was the largest source of tourists for Singapore. And if you rewind time to mid-January, most of us had not heard about COVID-19. It wasn't even named yet. You just knew there was some question mark about a potential infection in Wuhan and there's some questions about whether there's human-to-human -human transmission. But I remember waking up about two days before Chinese New Year and hearing that China was planning to lock down Wuhan. And mind you, Wuhan is a city much, much bigger than Singapore. And I can tell you as an Asian, to contemplate shutting down a city that large two days before Chinese New Year is a big deal. So there may have been a delay, but I have no doubts that once they understood the gravity of the situation, they did things which frankly, most of us would have hesitated to do. And then when they did so, they did so decisively, comprehensively. And to be fair, if you look at the results, meaning the outcome within China itself, I think you have to give credit where credit is due. And in fact, they have shown that border restrictions, quarantine, testing, social distancing, the wearing of masks, the willingness to take decisive actions, even at great economic cost, is worthwhile. So I am sorry if I'm not willing to enter into a blame game, because in fact, now with the benefit of six months, let me put it to you this way. No government has executed anti-COVID anti strategy perfectly. All of us have had I've made our share of mistakes. But at the end of the day, this is first an international issue which requires collaboration and cooperation rather than blame. There will be time for blame after the crisis is over. But right now we need to focus on cooperation and collaboration. Second lesson, we need to act earlier rather than later. And we need to be prepared to pay the cost economically because as long as COVID is not controlled, the economy can't recover. And opening prematurely or opening in a reckless way is very dangerous and will be completely counterproductive. The third point I would make is the only way we are all going to emerge from this crisis is a, if a vaccine is found. I know there are a couple of hundred vaccine candidates, but let me say this, that actually if history is a guide, so far we don't know of any effective long-term vaccine for coronaviruses. So even if vaccine is found, how effective it will be, how long it will last, we don't know. What this does mean is that we are going to have to live with this virus for at least one to two years perhaps even longer. And if, if you want to be more depressed, let me put it to you this way. Look at the figures in Singapore. Our mortality rate right now today is about 0.05%. Now, that sounds wonderful and very low. And of course, it reflects the access to great medical care which we have in Singapore. But let me put it to you this way. I do not believe that is all due to the wonderful system that we have in Singapore. The truth is, in most parts of the world, where mortality rates are apparently higher, you're underdiagnosing the extent of the spread. But what is even more worrying is this. I do not believe COVID-19 is the real big one. 
if you look at the mortality rates of the pandemic influenza in 1918, it was far, far higher than this. If you look at SARS, it was far higher than this. So what I'm actually saying is this actually is a rehearsal, a rehearsal for the really big pandemic, which I still believe is overdue. And in fact, we need to use this time to prepare ourselves for the next pandemic. And that means investing in research and development. It means governments collaborating because the only way we're going to be safe is when every one of us is safe. So we believe that vaccines are a global good. We believe in vaccine multilateralism. We believe we need to hedge our bets by shipping in resources into a common pool. And depending on which vaccine emerges, quickly expand the access to it, and especially to countries which are most vulnerable and where the populations need it most. So my point again is that this is a world that's crying out for multilateralism, and we need to do that. And not to focus on yesterday's battles or to focus on the blame game, which is ultimately unproductive and will not provide solutions for the future challenges that we are confronting. Okay, uh, Minister Balakrishnan, I should add that you are also Dr. Balakrishnan. So when you tell us that this is, this is the, uh, not the big one and that there's other big uh, things around the corner, you speak with yes. kind of professional expertise as well. Yes, but I'm not the only one saying that. You know, that yeah, you, sure. This is really <laughs> just a dry run. A quick follow-up to that, and then I'll hand back to Anya, uh, who will uh, close us and ask a question. But, you, you, I mean, you, a theme of your comments throughout has been really a plea to look at multilateralism and to look at uh, and, and not to see things in competitive terms. And I also, I, I get a suggestion maybe that we're looking at the wrong issues, that you think that we're looking at 20th century issues of uh, yes. economic and strategic rivalry rather than things like pandemics uh, or, or indeed climate change. climate change. Exactly. But I mean, I must say, as somebody who writes about international affairs, I can recognize what you're saying it makes total sense, but I just feel that things are moving in the opposite direction. Is that how you see it? I guess as a professional diplomat, you have to be optimistic. And yes, I see problems, and it's important to be realistic in our assessments of the problems. The superpower rivalry, the risk of war has gone up the inability of the world as a whole to cooperate and deal with multilateral problems is plain for us all to see. The impact of the digital economy, its impact on jobs, the stagnation of middle-class wages is evident in all societies. So I, I say this so that you understand that I'm not you know, a starry-eyed optimist. But what am I worried about if I look in history? And if I go back to, say, the period from 1870 to maybe 1914, you think about that period. And I spend a lot of time thinking about that period because that, in fact, was a period of globalization. That was a period of technological change. Steamships came about. That was a period when there was a rising power in Germany. There was an old hegemon on which the sun never set, the United Kingdom. And everyone said, well, there's interdependence. War doesn't make sense. And yet we know we stumbled into the First World War. And from 1914 to about 1945, world trade as a percentage of global GDP fell to about 10%. And after 1945, it's really Pax Americana. And as I said earlier, America constituted 40% of global GDP, and it was worth America's while to underwrite the world order. And you saw a golden age from 1945 until about 1980. But that golden age was really confined to democratic, capitalist, free markets. And I say that because Singapore also benefited from that golden age. But after that, 
after 1980, China opened up and then India and the rest came online. And in a sense then, the beginning of the end of the golden age of capitalism was already written on the walls. And 2008, 2009, when we had the global financial crisis, I think that that neatly punctuates the end of that age. And the last decade, therefore, has been a turbulent period of political, social, and economic change. And is it important for us, as pro whether we are professional diplomats or commentators, to understand that and to posit where we are on these global currents? Now, your question really is, at the end of all this, am I optimistic or am I pessimistic? And I still remain optimistic because if you talk to all the players, and I have the, the privilege or the luxury of talking to all the major players, the truth is no one is blind. Everyone recognizes the dangers. Everyone sees it from their own perspective. Everyone wants to right what they think is a wrong. But I still believe that because we truly, truly are a more interdependent world, I think America and China, I'm still hopeful, will arrive at some modest vivendi. I say that because I've seen that for myself, at least on the Paris Agreement. I think they will have to work out some kind of arrangement for the weapons of the future. And we know that there are many technological marvels which are going to be used, which could be used for military use. We are all going to be confronted by pandemics worse than what we are facing today. We're going to be confronted by climate change with far greater economic impact than what we have faced. And the two examples I've given you on climate change and pandemic will require global cooperation. So maybe, just maybe, we might be forced to unlearn some old habits and learn some new ways of cooperation. And so that's why I, I still remain optimistic. Now, perhaps it's just the, the job, the occupational hazard of being a diplomat. But seriously, from speaking, and again, from the case of Singapore, where we've dealt with both Democrat and Republican administrations, um, what has been remarkable for us in Singapore actually has been the consistency of American foreign policy. If you take a 70-year period, Individual decisions, individual issues, you know, there, there will be noise, there'll be fluctuation. But generally, America has been, and I know Joseph Nye is going to talk about the moral elements of foreign policy, but maybe I, I just make a, a, a preliminary plug for it. America has been a hegemon in our part of the world, but it has been a constructive and welcome hegemon in our part of the world doesn't mean we agree with America all the time, but we've recognized that there is a moral dimension to American leadership. And in general, in general, despite the mistakes America leadership may have made, in general, it has been positive. This formula of a liberal world order, rules-based world order, multilateral institutions, multilateral processes, has been a formula for peace and prosperity. Even in the case of Europe, the fact that they had the European Union and the Marshall Plan has made war in Western Europe unthinkable. If you think about the last century, Germany invaded France something like three times in 70 years. The last 70 years, I think war has become unthinkable in Western Europe. Now, if we can continue to build on that, I think the future remains optimistic. So that's my, my spiel. Well, thank you very much. It's always nice to end on a note of optimism, particularly in a very worrying time. And you even went beyond the call of duty and segued us nicely to the next session with Joe Nye. So you, you, if, uh, you could, could always become a moderator later. But thank you so much, uh, Minister Balakrishnan. That, that was great. And I'll now hand back to, to Anya.